Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And today, we'll be discussing the different types of the ameloblastoma. But first, we gotta get into that disclaimer, and that is that all of the views and opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any organization that I may be a part of or that employs me, and that this is not intended as medical advice, but for educational purposes only. Should you have any questions about your oral or systemic health, please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. I want to thank Michael in Boston who requested this video. If you have any requests for any future videos, please reach out in the comments below or shoot me an email which you can find in my bio. The ameloblastoma is the most common adonogenic neoplasm. With that being said, it's still very rare. When it occurs, it is often slow growing, but can be very locally infiltrative and aggressive. In fact, buccal and lingual cortical expansion of the bone is often a present finding. Tooth roots too in the area may become resorbed by the growth of the tumor. The vast majority of ameloblastomas occur in the posterior mandible. And when they occur, they often look like a multilocular radiolucency and are commonly described as having a soap bubble appearance. If you need to review what the differential diagnosis is for the multilocular radiolucency in the posterior mandible, be sure to check out my macho video up above. Ameloblastomas are neoplasms of ameloblasts. These are the cells that create the enamel or the outer hard white portion of the tooth. Because enamel is deposited from the basal side of the cell and moves in the opposite direction from the dentin, the cells exhibit what we call reverse polarity, where the nucleus is actually on the opposite side of the basement membrane. Treatment of ameloblastoma is a little bit controversial and a lot of different oral surgeons that treat ameloblastomas have different treatment protocols. Curatage, which is just scooping out the lesion, has about a 50 to 90% recurrence rate. Marginal resection has about a 15% recurrence rate, so most surgeons recommend a 1 to 2 centimeter margin. There are several different histologic subtypes, but for the most part, these aren't clinically relevant. In this video, I'll be going over all of the most common subtypes and avoiding some of the more controversial or extremely rare subtypes like the dentinoameloblastoma, keratoameloblastoma, and adenoid ameloblastoma. We'll really be focusing on the most common and most clinically relevant subtypes. We also won't be discussing the malignant counterparts of the ameloblastoma, the ameloblastic carcinoma. Again, because it's exceedingly rare and the characteristics are very different from the benign counterpart. The follicular pattern is the most common pattern, and this is the one that most closely resembles tooth bud development. That's when you have this outer layer of cells exhibiting reverse polarity, which I like to liken to piano keys, and the inside between this layer is a spiderweb-like material that we equate to the stellate reticulum in a normal developing tooth bud. A relatively consistent finding in many of the different types of ameloblastoma is a hyalinized or very pink area surrounding the tumor islands. The plexiform ameloblastoma is also a relatively common pattern where you have connecting cords that run throughout the entire tumor island and it looks very much like a bunch of roads converging together. Around these cords that all are interconnected, you might appreciate some reverse polarity as well as some of that stellate reticulum-like areas. The acanthomatous pattern is a little less common, and that's when we see squamous metaplasia between the cells exhibiting the reverse polarity, or the ameloblast-like cells. In place of that spiderweb-looking stellate reticulum that you see in the follicular or plexiform patterns, you see what looks like squamous pearls or squamatization. Now it's important to note that this can be confused for a squamous cell carcinoma or a malignancy, but the acanthomatous ameloblastoma acts absolutely no different from any of the other subtypes. There's no increase of aggression or malignant transformation. You can appreciate in this example of acanthomatous ameloblastoma that there often is an area of more traditional or follicular pattern 
in addition to the squamatization that you see. And that's not uncommon to have an ameloblastoma with several different subtypes mixed in. Similarly, we have the granular cell ameloblastoma. And that's where that spiderweb-like stellate reticulum areas are replaced with granular cells that have a very finely granular cytoplasm. These granules have been shown both uh, with EM and with immunohistochemistry to be lysosomes. This is one of my favorite types of ameloblastomas. The peripheral ameloblastoma is an ameloblastoma that occurs in the soft tissues, so there's no bony involvement whatsoever. This often appears as a bump on the gums. Now, the desmoplastic ameloblastoma is where things start to get a little bit different. The desmoplastic ameloblastoma is different from the other subtypes in that it has a marked predilection for the anterior jaws as opposed to the posterior jaws and has an equal distribution between the maxilla and the mandible. The other interesting finding is that this can often be mixed radiolucent and radioopaque, which you can really appreciate in this case that we just had in our service. The differential diagnosis may include a calcifying odontogenic cyst or even a calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor or pinboard tumor. You can better understand the radiographic appearance by understanding the histologic appearance. Under the microscope, a desmoplastic ameloblastoma looks like the ameloblastic islands have been smushed and they become these very thin stretched out cords and a very dense fibrous stroma that dense fibrous stroma undergoes a little bit of metaplasia and it allows the lesion to look a mixed radiolucent, radioopaque. So there's no distinct calcification within the lesions because that dense fibrous stroma is so dense, it actually begins to look like a hard tissue on radiography. So if you see a mixed radiolucent, radioopaque lesion in the anterior jaws, Desmoplastic ameloblastoma absolutely has to be on the differential. Now we're going to wade a little bit into controversial territory, and that is discussing the unicystic ameloblastoma. Some of the most consistent findings in the unicystic ameloblastoma is that they occur in younger patients. About half occur in the second decade of life. And when they occur, they almost always, and we're talking greater than 90%, occur in the posterior mandible and often associated with the crown of a wisdom tooth or third molar. The unicystic ameloblastoma has been separated into three distinct subtypes, luminal, intraluminal, and mural. The luminal unicystic ameloblastoma can be a little bit of a difficult diagnosis to make sometimes. That's because it doesn't have those traditional ameloblastic features. Oftentimes, we will see the reverse polarity in the basal layer of the cyst lining, as well as some stellate reticulum-like areas, and maybe even that hyalinization around the basement layer that we saw in some of the other subtypes. This is where the ameloblastoma is exclusively found in just the lining of the cyst. It's found nowhere else. The intraluminal is when that lining projects into the middle of the cyst where now the tumor is within the middle of that cyst containment. This is most often the plexiform pattern, where we will have a luminal component as the lining of the cyst, and then a projection into the middle of the cyst that is most commonly of a plexiform pattern, which you can appreciate in this case that we saw in my service. And finally, we have the mural or intramural type of unicystic ameloblastoma. And that's when we see islands of ameloblastoma within the fibrous wall of the cyst. It's important to note that sometimes we have all three components where we have a luminal component lining the cyst, an intraluminal component that's growing into the middle of the cyst, and then mural component that's in the dense fibrous connective tissue. The issue is, how do we treat these lesions? The suggestion is that when there is mural involvement and there are distinct tumor islands within the connective tissue, that perhaps this ameloblastoma that's described as unicystic with mural involvement might behave very similarly to a traditional ameloblastoma. 
the issue arises in that a biopsy is only one small portion of the larger lesion. In addition, when we're looking at biopsies under the microscope, it's only a representative section. It's impossible to get a full 360 view because we're cutting onto slides and getting rid of some of that tissue. So what may look primarily luminal on biopsy, where the mulloblastoma is confined to the lumen, on the surgical resection, we might see mural involvement. Many surgeons opt for enucleation and curatage. There are a wide variety of studies that discuss the recurrence rate. Some studies say it's as low as 10 to 20% after the cyst has been enucleated without doing a very large resection, but others say that the recurrence can go between 30 to 60%, so it's a little bit controversial. Oftentimes, the focus is on the subtype. Is it truly luminal? Is it truly intraluminal? Is there mural involvement? But it's kind of uncertain as to what that means. If a biopsy is truly intraluminal, but then when it's enucleated and curetted, we're seeing mural involvement, does that mean that a second surgery has to be done? Well, my opinion is that the clinical scenario should di dictate the treatment more so than the histologic subtype. Here's a perfect example in the real world applying this concept. This is a 10 year old with a very large radiolucency in the posterior mandible. When removed, it was found to be a grossly cystic, meaning the surgical specimen looked like a cyst lining that molar, which you can appreciate in that gross photograph. In this case, the patient was treated with a marginal resection without continuity defect, and there was a significant amount of bone fill. Younger patients do tend to create a lot more bone after large surgeries like this. It's important to note that it is now five years later and there has been no recurrence in this patient. The histologic subtype of this lesion was an intraluminal unicystic amyloblastoma with mural involvement. So did that patient actually need a hemimandibulectomy? Well, I think that might've been a little bit much for a 10 year old where we have great bone fill and no continuity defect. The patient created their own bone to help make up for that surgery rather than having to get an artificial plate placed. All this to say that the unicystic amyloblastoma is not as cut and dry as we wish it was. A lot of people like to think unicystic amyloblastoma, treat it conservatively unless there's mural involvement. But I think that the clinical scenario should dictate the treatment more than the histologic subtype. In addition, any patient with an amyloblastoma has to be followed pretty closely for recurrence, especially if you're treating them in a more conservative fashion. So I hope I didn't get too far into the weeds, but I think that this is a very important concept that leads to a lot of confusion in both pathologists and surgeons alike. Ultimately, I highly suggest reading the literature and seeing what the latest guidelines are regarding treatment of any pathologic entity. Thanks again for watching this deep dive into the myeloblastoma. If you think somebody else will enjoy this video as well, be sure to share it with them and give this video a like. If you want to see more content about different types of oral pathology, be sure to subscribe and turn that bell notification on. Thanks again for watching and be well.